so now in this part, uh, I'm going to try and uh, do, well, again, math, all right? Uh, and the math I'm going to do is I'm just going to square a quaternion. Uh, and think about the real part. And I'm going to square a quaternion and think about the imaginary part. And I'm going to uh, take a conjugate of a quaternion uh, times another quaternion. Uh, so those are math operations. And yet I'm going to say those very simple math operations can be mapped directly to physics. Uh, the, in the first case, it's going to be about special relativity. In the second case, it's going to be about my proposal for uh, quaternion gravity. Uh, which is not general relativity. Um, and then finally, it's going to be about quantum mechanics. And, uh, you know, we had some philosophers at the meeting, and it's kind of like, you know, math is physics. <laughs> Stop. Uh, you don't have to think about other issues. Very direct uh, kind of approach. All right. So, um, so a quaternion times a quaternion is a quaternion, and I can take whatever pair of events I want to. Um, and I usually think about the change in events so I don't have to worry about, like, where's the origin uh, that I'm dealing with? I'm dealing with a delta. Uh, that delta is supposed to look like it's a differential, like those points could be arbitrarily close to one another in space-time, and uh, I think of them that way. And when I go ahead and calculate the square, um, that part in blue, that is, uh, well, we got dx d, dy squared plus dz squared. That's something the Egyptians knew about, uh, that different surveyors uh, on, the, uh, on the plane of the Nile could uh, uh, agree upon those values, uh, that, that square, even if they don't agree on the x's and the y's and uh, the z's. Uh, but the square, they're going to say, same. Um, and Einstein's great advancement was to say, well, time and space have a relationship to each other. And it was actually, yeah, th that uh, in, uh, thing was it was in his paper, and it certainly was much more an uh, emphasis of Minkowski that was, uh, that was a, a, an invariant interval of space-time. And then in 19... Uh, 2015, I started wondering, well, what the heck is going to, uh, what sort of physics is going to result if people agree on the uh, a light green box? Um, and I actually think it's got to be just as important because, I mean, special relativity is, is absolutely core. Um, the, yeah, in fact, when, when two observers agree about the uh, Lorentz invariant interval, they disagree about those other three terms, space times time. And well, why is that of use? It's of use because it now will provide you with the information about how they are moving relative to each other. You know, if all the two observers uh, uh, reported was, wow, we agreed about the interval, and you asked the follow up question, well, what was your speed relative to that other person? They they don't have an answer. <laughs> That's a problem because they should have the answer. They have the information, you know. And if you keep this space times time terms sitting right next to it, then you'll be able to say, oh, they were just moving uh, along this y direction, and that's it. That's a that's a complete story. Um, all right. So, uh, oh, and I do own quaternions.com. I should say. Uh, and the reason I bought it <laughs> was because of that light uh, blue box. I saw that and I said, that's, that's the key to special relativity. And that's not an accident that uh, that, that works out. And so I, I bought it in like 1997, I believe. All right. So um, is that interesting or is that just funny? And, uh, and there was one source on the internet, this Lobos uh, Meutel, who thought it was just funny. He's got uh, quite a number of experience points. Uh, it's increased even since then. And uh, I do not happen to like this person, uh, to be honest. Um, although he has greater <laughs> credibility on the internet in the sense that uh, my reputation score was on the order of 29. Uh, and he went in off on, onto this math thing and said, oh, this is the most important symmetry, uh, the, the most important value. Um, and he didn't say what symmetries were involved because you can't talk about uh, 
these things without saying what what was what under what group does that value not change? And it was, you know, it's it's it's, it's just really sad that it was what I call sophisticated garbage. Um, but that's what I expect from Lobos. Okay, so. Um, and this is a dangerous question for me to ask um, because um, because I am a fringe physicist in the sense that I am not a professional, um, and therefore fringe physicists have contributed so far just about nothing. <laughs> and uh, they always bring an account Einstein, okay? But I'll tell you why. I'm, uh, he, let me read the quote, okay? And it's not from Einstein, okay? It's from Abraham Pays, who did a scientific biography of Einstein, and it was right in the um, in the uh, prefix. He said, "Had I to compose a one-sentence scientific biography of him, Einstein, I would write better than anyone before or after he, him. He knew how to invent invariance principles and make use of statistical fluctuations." Okay, so this was back in 2015, and I was thinking about that very quote. And I had written down on a piece of paper the square of a quaternion for like the 1700th time. <laughs> and then I said, okay, I just had a, a, a proposal for how gravity works, crash and burn, for perfectly valid technical reasons. It, the proposal not only used quaternions, but it used a different type of number. And somebody said, hey, how does that behave under rotations? And I said, well, it changes. Then it doesn't conserve angular momentum. And therefore, it's wrong. It took me like five days to, once that critique came up, of course, uh, it to, anyway, uh, without going too far into it, I, I had nothing. And so I wrote down the square, thought about this quote, and said, geez, what happens if people agree to that, those th other three terms? Which I had asked about, like, like literally in 1997. And I said, hey, what are these called, people? <laughs> and I, you know, got crickets. Um, and uh, nobody said anything. Uh, and it, it doesn't have a name. That's what's weird about it. See, if you think about what is space over time, you go, well, that's velocity. What is space times space? And you go, well, that's area. Well, what's space over space? And you go, uh, space over space? Angles. Those are angles. Okay. And so what is space times time? No, we really shouldn't have silence there. <laughs> it's just a different permutation, okay? Uh, this has got to play a role in physics. It can't just say, well, no, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm, I'm never going to be used by it in any kind of physics ever. I mean, it's too simple. And, um, and so we are going to explore what I'm calling space times time since there isn't already a really common name for it, all right? All right, so um, we're using equivalence classes here for both special relativity and my proposal for quantum gravity. So in special relativity, um, they are, two observers are going to say, hey, we're both inertial observers, but you're moving at a different speed if when we calculate in one reference frame uh, what an interval is and we do it in the other one, and the real part is exactly the same. All right. Uh, and here is the Minkowski space-time diagram. Um, if the number is, that, that squared number, is, if it's positive, it's going to be in the time-like part of the light cone. Oh, I should say, if, it, if you calculate it and the real part is like zero, then you're dealing with the black lines there, you're dealing with the light cone itself. Uh, and if it's negative, that's the world of uh, space-like separated uh, pairs of events, and it's all very nice and uh, simple to do. Um, and all I'm saying that is that for quaternion gravity proposal, 
is that the imaginary parts of the square are what we agree upon, okay? And so now we see the zeros are actually the dt axis and the dr axis. And it was only relatively recently that somebody said, you mean there, if, if something is simultaneous for one observer, you know, the dt is, is zero between two events, all observers are gonna agree about that. Well, that's kind of strange. Says <laughs> well, the one thing we've learned is like oh, simultaneous uh, simultaneity is relative. Well, we're we're exploring a different branch of physics, and in this one, actually, you do agree on being simultaneous. So this is a little scary to do, uh, but that's what the graph is. And you say, hold it, that graph is basically uh, the light cone rotated by forty five degrees. It's like. Yeah, that's all it is, okay? And um, nature must be using this sort of graph uh, somehow. All right. So what I found was that if I just say, look, here's a symmetry principle, let's all be happy, uh, physicists in general uh, were not engaged. And I think a reason for that is that Physicists usually think in terms of transformation laws, you know, the Lorentz transformation and other kinds of uh, transformation laws, gauge transformations. Uh, and those are all, of course, connected to deep symmetries, the, the, the symmetry, uh, uh, gauge symmetries and, uh, and that sort of thing. But a complete picture necessarily involves both, okay? And... I only provided one, and <laughs> it was not very satisfying. So um, a fellow on the internet, um, Purple Penguin is the only way I know of of him, uh, the only handle I have on him. Uh, he actually came up with his derivation. I had a separate video on it, but I, I, I did this one for the group uh, where I, I here's, here's the thing I wrote out. And I'm gonna break it up into four parts. Um, first of all, we go into the assumptions and uh, that we're going to measure time with clocks that are in our possession, so, you know, wristwatch time, as it were. Uh, distance is going to be measured by uh, a pair of uh, events um, uh, released um, at the same time and then transported to some observer. Um, but what we're not going to do, all right, is that we're not going to say, and we all agree about uh, the light cone. Because if we do that, then we're just in the world of special relativity. And what we're trying to do is relax um, things so that we might kind of get into a different space, a uh, different, different sort of physics, different sorts of transformation laws, different sorts of insights into how nature works. Okay. And we're not going to set the origin, not going to worry about that. We're going to take it, you know, uh, delta between two events. And so once you do that, you don't have to worry about the, where the origin is. Okay. So, um, what should we start with? Well, if you've got this whole restriction on, on how clocks work and how you're going to be measuring distance, well, we actually know a, a coordinate transformation that's, that works. We've got this T prime equals gamma T plus gamma beta X, and you have X prime equals gamma X plus gamma beta T. All right. Uh, so those are totally standard where beta and uh, gamma are exactly kind of what you expect them to be. Um, we know that works fine. All right, but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose a, a, a function, a, a constant function, such that we get a kind of a simpler expression for, uh, for uh, time um, in, the, in the new new reference frame. So T double prime, okay? Um, and we're gonna add in this constant function, a minus beta X prime, and when you do that, you go, oh, you chose that just to wipe out the X, X primes in there, didn't you? And it's like, yeah, that's exactly why I did it. Um, and when you do that sort of transformation, you end up with uh, D, uh, T double prime equals one over gamma DT. And you go, well, that is strange. Okay, because <laughs> the relationship we're used to is it equals gamma DT, not one over over gamma um, dt, but that's just a consequence. It's just it's just algebra, okay? So we can't say it's wrong. We can say it's strange, because it is strange. 
And one of the uh, ways that it, it is strange is that if the change in this double time frame is zero, in other words, if, if two events were simultaneous, then in the unprimed frame, they're also simultaneous. Okay? So we are not doing special relativity. Okay? <laughs> There's the clearest sign possible that we've chosen strange coordinates and, and, and a strange functions such that we've got this strange result. But it's okay. We're being logically consistent. So let's proceed, see how far we get. All right. So now if we think about lengths, and we, uh, we don't have to worry about being simultaneous, okay? <laughs> that, that part's easy. Um, and we fire our little um, photons back, and they, um, they land there, and we go, oh, so this is gonna land at 2t and 4t, and you go, oh, so, so this is back to normal. We've got uh, a dx double prime equals gamma uh, dx, so that's, that's nice. Um, so now if we think about um, dx double prime times um, dt double prime, but we think about them in the in the unprime coordinates, that means, oh, we've got a gamma and we've got one over gamma, that means that's invariant. Okay, that was kind of our, our little goal uh, and we've achieved it, uh, but, but that's for space times time. But let's think about speeds. Okay, because speeds is what people normally think about. And you go, okay, put one over the other, and you go, oh, that's the, they're not agree, going to agree about speeds like at all. There's going to be a gamma squared factor involved. It's like, whoa, so things really zip uh, in between, relative uh, between these two frames. That's, that's definitely strange. Uh, seems almost illegal. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So then what I did was I said, okay, let's think about intervals, okay, where we just um, have these, uh, the difference of time squared um, minus the difference of um, in space squared. And um, we, we've got both, both in the primed and unprimed frame, but, and, and they're, they're just, they're just that. They, they just end up being kind of boring, but it becomes interesting when we take our little, um, where we think about what the double prime frame looks like uh, given the unprimed kind of relationships that we have, and we just do this little substitution. We get the squared, and we get one minus beta squared and one plus beta squared. Um, and then if we uh, toss in um, the escape velocity of um, Newton from Newton's time. You know when he was firing a cannon off of a mountaintop and it eventually made uh, made an orbit and then he was like, no, let's, let's see what it takes to get out to infinity and stop. Uh, that's the value. When you do that, you go, hold it. That looks like uh, the Schwarzschild solution of uh, general relativity. And so that will tap uh, pass weak field tests. I was like, that's kind of cool. <laughs> okay. Now, why did I put this warning thing in here? Um, I did because I actually stepped through this uh, proof or derivation uh, with two people at the conference and they both were like, man, I don't know if you, you're just doing that because you end up like with a result that's connected to physics. And it's like, I'm totally guilty of that. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons I think um, uh, people don't take me too seriously is that I've been focusing on that for like, a, why don't we just say a really, really long time? <laughs> that, you know, I know you have to do this and I got there and um, people like, well, you, you, you looked in the back of the book, you cheated. Um, I don't know how to really reply to that other than that's that is the, what I do because I want to connect to experimental tests of gravity and it's not like you have a choice I mean what hey you haven't you know paid enough attention to what Qu Qu uh, Clifford Will has written uh, about experimental tests you got to end up here okay and I am there and that is to me a good thing um, but I'm just saying, you know, take it with a nice big block of salt. But I, actually, something else happened that was uh, that just recently, and that uh, and that was a realization that you know, of course, this uh, relativistic uh, velocity, where does it come from? 
Well, it actually comes from solving Newton's scalar field theory. <laughs> so it's kind of like, what, am I doing Newton's scalar field theory along with space times time invariance to make sure that things work out uh, well with the equivalence principle? Because that's what, I mean, that's what I'm really trying to do. I'm trying to say that everything about gravity can be expressed in this type of uh, expression for the uh, interval squared. That, and uh, that would be that would be Newton, scalar Newton, uh, with space-time time invariance, and that may be the combination uh, that's needed to come up with a, a new uh, proposal that's consistent with the experimental tests. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> but, hmm, I don't have a Lagrange density right there, do I? Um, and... Well, now, now I'm kind of up in the field. I mean, certainly when I wrote this, I, uh, I hadn't thought about the, you know, the escape velocity coming out of Newton's scalar theory. But, um, you know, it, it, it's still true that it, it doesn't have uh, a metric tensor, um, it, that, that this really is kind of being uh, um, number, the uh, number theory, not geometry theory. In other words, there's no metrics, no connections, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that, you know, special relativity is a constraint on all physical theories uh, that you can write. Um, and there isn't like a relativistic, um, there isn't a, rel there isn't a particle associated with uh, special relativity. Um, and the space time time invariance, well, as a proposal, it's kind of putting a, a different kind of constraint on every single physical theory you can write. Um, uh, and, but because it's not based on varying uh, the, a metric tensor, there's not going to be uh, a rank zero, um, uh, sorry, a rank, um, a spin two uh, particle expressing the field theory. So, um, hmm. so, so now, as I say, uh, since I gave this talk, now that I realize, oh, really, I'm kind of relying on Newton's scalar proposal for gravity that hopefully respects uh, the uh, strong equivalence principle. Uh, that might be uh, worthy of, of further study. Uh, and believe me, people have studied quantizing Newton's gravity uh, field theory because it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> and they always, the first thing they, they're going to point out is it doesn't respect the equivalence principle. And so therefore we know it's, this is just a toy and it's a broken toy. Uh, if it's less broken, well, uh, it might be uh, kind of curious. All right. Um, and, and then, of course, the, the follow-up question is, what, is this, is this uh, proposal going to be different in any sort of way? And I think it will be. Uh, in the sense of um, I'm always going to change terms that involve changes in time and uh, change terms in ch uh, ch change terms in, in space and um, you know actually I wrote this and I, I st I'm now starting to get worried about it <laughs> that's the pro that's a problem of doing physics is is you know you always end up going maybe I am not thinking about this quite straight because uh, I always said oh there's a time thing and there's a space thing and so the E fields won't change and the B fields are totally going to change because they both got space parts and space parts but the, the time part the, now that I'm looking at this and you know you write it down uh, in a concrete way I go hold it that's not a time part that's a one over time part so shouldn't that be not one over gamma but gamma and in, in other words Shouldn't that be gamma squared uh, E and gamma squared beta? And it's like, wow, that's... So as as somebody of limited skill set as I am, I, I'm always uh, doubting uh, myself, uh, which I should. I should I tend to take myself with a block of salt and other people take me with a mountain of salt. Uh, and so now I'm looking at that and thinking, well, maybe that should really be gamma squared E. Uh, one, thing's, one thing I feel confident about, though, is that <clears throat> it's not going to be the same. Uh, there's no way that can work out the same. 
uh, <coughs> whereas, <coughs> sorry, whereas in uh, general relativity, I think that uh, the E and the B fields are actually invariants uh, in order to transform like a tensor, and they had to go through specific hoops. So um, I really just think if we measure the pointing vector or you know measure the E field and the B field and compared them at different heights, believe me, that that's probably technically incredibly uh, demanding um, that I think they're going to be different. And uh, I like this sort of test in the sense that it's 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 cleaner uh, than than anything else because it's just well if it's supposed to be the same and it's the same then general relativity is correct and if the E and B fields are actually different at different um, points in a gravitational field then that makes uh, it much more likely that my proposal has uh, is is uh, more closer to the truth. All right.